poetry is what we do. We are the gentlemen. Woo! A spoken word. D G S W. Reciting poetry is what we do. We are the gentlemen. Who? A spoken word. Who are 
you not to be? Who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. Listen, there is nothing enlightening about shrinking so other people won't feel insecure around you. You see, we were all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. And you see, it's not just in some of us, no. But it is in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give people permission to do the same. Our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. Our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. You see, our deepest fear is that we are powerful. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful. Beyond measure. Beyond measure. It is our light. It is our light. Not our darkness. Not our darkness. That, that most frightens us. And we asked ourselves, who am I to be brilliant? To be brilliant. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. Talented. Talented. Fabulous. Fabulous. Actually. Actually. Who are you not to be? Who are you not to be?
everybody likes to win. But if you think that you can't, it's almost certain you won't. If you think you will lose, you're lost. Four out in the world we find. Success begins with the fellow's will. It's all in the state of mind. If you think you're outclassed, you won't. battles don't always go to the stronger nor faster man but sooner or later the one who wins is the one Good afternoon, everyone. Is this, is this on? Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> thank you, thank you. If we could give the distinguished gentleman who spoke a word another round of applause. He did a really great job. I think they deserve a standing ovation. <laughs> thank you so much, gentlemen. Uh, all right, well, uh, in a couple moments, we're going to get ready for our forum, so if you can give us a couple moments, we're gonna get the panel up to the stage. Um, if not, thank you so much. Enjoy um, the conversation that's happening. I look forward to moderating the discussion in a couple moments, all right? Thank you so much.
Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My name is Gabrielle Jackson, and I am a former 2014 Teach for America Corps member in the greater Cleveland area. And I am currently a fourth grade teacher at Cleveland College Preparatory School. And our school is located in the Slavic Village community on Fleet Avenue. Um, it is an honor and a privilege to be here with you all today and hosting our second elementary youth forum at the City Club. And today's forum is focusing on being an upstander, why our choices matter. Now, the concept of being an upstander is centuries old, and we see examples of upstanders in every facet of our lives. From courtrooms to classrooms, everyday individuals stand up and speak out for those who feel they have no voice. Facing history in ourselves, an inter international education and professional development organization defines an upstander as a person who has chosen to make a difference in a world by speaking out against injustice and creating positive change. The term coined by a diplomat, Samantha Power, was popularized by facing history in ourselves, has now been recognized as an official word in the English language. The two students behind this initiative, Sarah Decker and Monica Mahal, began their petition in their Wachung Hills Regional High School facing history's class more than three years ago. So these were students who created this change. According to StopTheBullying.org, being an upstander is about moving from silence to action. Bystanders contribute to the problem. Upstanders stop the problem. Research shows that others speaking out or taking action stops bullying behavior over half the time and within seconds. Now let's look at four words that we need to know in order to better understand what it means to be an upstander. Our first word is perpetrator. Everybody repeat after me, perpetrator. perpetrator. Now a, pers a perpetrator is a person who does harm or tries to harm others. In our schools, these can be bullies. At our jobs, these can be bullies. Our next word is victim. Everybody say victim. victim. A victim is a person who is harmed by someone or is the target of that harm. And there can be all different types of harm. It can be physical, mental, emotional, or financial. Um, our next word is bystander. Everybody say bystander. 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 Thank you. A bystander is a person who observes harm being done and does nothing. Now our last word that we need to know is upstander. Everybody say upstander. 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 An upstander is a person who tries to stop harm in some way and stands up for the victim. Now upstanders aren't always successful in stopping the harm. Sometimes they have to reach out to an adult, a person of authority, or their teacher in order to help the victim. Today, we have three leaders who embody every aspect of being an upstander. We will hear how being an upstander has played out in their personal lives, their work, and their leadership. We will learn how our choices matter. Moderating today is my good friend, Mr. Anthony Price, 2015 Gates Millennial Scholarship winner and founder of Be The Change Venture. He also recently had a birthday. Anthony has just completed his first year of college at Wesleyan University in Connecticut, while in high school, Anthony was part of the Executive Youth Council for the City Club. We're happy to have him back with us today. On behalf of the City Club of Greater Cleveland, thank you for joining us today in partnership with Teach for America. Now we'll turn today's forum over to our moderator, Anthony Price, to introduce our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, um, and I want to thank Gabby for that wonderful introduction. Um, so it feels great to be back on the City Club stage again. I can't believe it's almost been a year now, so it's bittersweet for me. And, and my birthday was yesterday, so thank you all for the birthday wishes. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I do want to introduce our wonderful panel uh, this, uh, this afternoon. So first we have Miss Honey Bell Bay, founder and director of Distinguished Gentlemen of Spoken World, the marvelous young men that just gave us a wonderful performance. I, I see them every time I'm in Cleveland. I, I'm just inspired by all of you guys. So thank you so much for performing uh, this afternoon. Um, next we have Dante Gibbs, Director of Youth Engagement, Neighborhood Leadership Institute 
and he's the 2017 fellow for the George Gunn Foundation. Um, he's also one of the founders of the Turkey Takeover, where over 200 Thanksgiving uh, meals are given away in East Cleveland each year. Um, and he's also the founder of Flow, the Future Leaders of the World, and has helped young people stand up as advocates. Um, last but not least, I have the honor to introduce uh, the Honorable uh, Judge Gail William Byers. She's the judge of South Euclid Municipal Court. She is the first African-American judge in South Euclid's history and well known for innovations around justice, particularly with in regard to public access to the court, sentencing, and mental health. So I, I just want to thank you all for coming uh, this evening. And it's great to have Ms. Bill Bay and Judge Byers uh, Williams back. Um, to the City Club stage. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So the first question I want to ask, um, according to the Oxford Dictionary, upstanding is a person uh, who speaks or acts in support of an individual or a cause, particularly someone who intervenes on behalf of a person being attacked or bullied. Um, each of you are here today because you made ex extraordinary choices um, on behalf of others as an upstander. Uh, Mr. Gibbs, like I said, before you started Turkey Takeover, um, you led a campus protest for Trayvon Martin and helped young people find their voices by publishing the uh, book Out of the Mouths of Babes, which I just finished reading. Um, Judge William Byers, your sentencing and advocacy um, on behalf of the most vulnerable. Um, and uh, Ms. Bill Bay, just yesterday you were on the front page of the Plain Dealer um, for your work with the distinguished gentleman and spoke a word, among other things. So, would each of you comment on these examples in your most profound moment um, as an upstander? And who would you like, and who would like to start off, I guess, uh, that question, that long question? <laughs> I'll go first. Okay. <laughs> um, first, I just, want to, I just want to say I'm very excited to be here on the stage. Um, some great people have been on this stage, so presidents and also Lewis Stokes, who um, um, his brother Carl Stokes, we're celebrating their legacy this year in Cleveland. So I'm very excited to be on this stage. Example of just being able to help young people find their voices through our program um, called Future Leaders of the World at Neighborhood Leadership Institute through the MyCom initiative. And MyCom stands for my commitment, my community. So right then and there, you're making a choice to be committed to yourselves and your community, your families, but also being able to learn ways of how to not only advocate for yourselves, but advocate for that community. So thinking about what an issue is in your community or in your school or something that you're facing personally, but being able to, one, create a speech and then also being able to publish that into a book. And so as Anthony mentioned, this is a book that young people, their speeches are in. It's a collection of their speeches called Out of the Miles of Babes, and it's a series. So they're on volume four right now. And so to be able to write a book and have that book available for purchase and then becoming entrepreneurs and learn another way to speak out and make money for it, I just applaud them for that, for trusting me with the idea and them actually completing it. And so there are 14 to 18 year olds and they are published authors before they graduate from high school. And also, this is one of my favorite shirts. Um, it's called Raise Your Hood, Raise Your Voice. So your voice is a common denominator. And what I mean by your hood is just your neighborhood. It could be your street. It could be your actual community, your city. But it is, it is your voice speaking up for someone or that area that raises that whole neighborhood because that's all it takes is just that one voice to raise it. And that's it. Well, I'm going to go because I know um, Ms. Honey Bell Bay is um, wonderfully um, gifted with oratory, so I'll leave her with the last word. I want to begin by thanking the City Club for their invitation to return here to be with you all today. I actually want to be like Miss Gabby or Anthony when I grow up and get the kind of reception that they did when they said hello to you all because you are an awesome group of young people here. And I'll tell you, when I was your age, I did not know what an upstander was. And I never n really envisioned myself being where I am right now. I knew that when I was younger, I certainly had experiences when I had to make choices. And it was always a choice between the right thing and the wrong thing. And I hoped I'd always make the right choices. 
And as a judge now, I have the responsibility to try to make the right choice every day. And sometimes the right choice isn't so obvious to the people who are there that I'm making the choices for. And I'll tell you, sometimes the choices are really hard too. And they're difficult because sometimes they affect mommies and daddies, they affect sisters and brothers or cousins or neighbors, but they're still the right choice. I mean, every now and then I have to make a choice that's really different and nobody expects that choice to be made or nobody expects that decision to be made. But it's also important. Um, one of the things Mr. Price mentioned was an experience that I had when I had, anybody here have a neighbor? Anybody have anybody living next door to them? Okay. And so leave your hand up if you're friends with your neighbors. Okay, that's most of the room. Is there anybody here who has a neighbor that they don't really, really get along with sometimes? Okay, or is there anybody here who has a friend that they sometimes don't get along with? We've all had those experiences too, right? Okay. And so I've had those experiences with people and they sometimes bring their troubles to court. And it's my job every now and then to try to help resolve it. And I had one experience when this, these neighbors had not gotten along for a very, very long time. And I'll tell you that one neighbor was a little more mean than, than your average neighbor. And they had been really, really mean to a family for a long time. And my job was not just to figure out how we could achieve justice for them, but maybe put something in place so that they stop being so mean. Anybody wish that somebody who's mean to you would just stop it and maybe there's somebody there to sort of help them figure out how? Okay. And I will tell you that it's nothing wrong when you see something or you see someone making a bad decision. Upstanders make the choice to get involved. And if you don't want to get involved yourself, you can always go and find an adult who's willing to help you raise your voice and help you find your voice. Because bullying is not fun, it's not right, and bullies sometimes are doing it out of fear themselves. And so I sometimes have to get involved because I see bullies too. And I have to stop bullies from continuing to be bullies. And I had a, a situation once when there were neighbors and one was really, really being a mean bully. And he was, he was terrible. And I tell you one thing I'll say, but making this story a little short, is after he and I finished, he never bullied that neighbor again. And I haven't seen him back again either. <laughs> and I hear they're getting along just fine. From the last I've heard, they've been living next door in the same place they've always lived and we've had no more problems. But I say that to you because it takes courage to stand up to bullies. And it's easy when you got a black robe on and a gavel. Sometimes it's not so easy when you're on a playground and you feel like you're the shortest one out the pack. So go find a teacher, find a friend, find someone to help you find your voice, but make sure you make the right choice. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm not sure if I should try to follow the judge, <laughs> but, uh, and I know Anthony said to think of your most, I think the word he used was profound, but the word, um, something comes to my mind, and I'm not quite sure it was profound, but someone came in this morning, and I don't see her now, but when I looked at her, I said, oh, she's beautiful. She looks like who I looked like when I was a kid. And in that brief second, I think that moment defined an upstander for me. So the paper um, yesterday, which I did not know was coming out in The Plain Dealer, the first line says something about, well, she's done a TED Talk, which is a big talk with all of these people coming to hear all of these really, really smart people talk about stuff. <laughs> so I don't know how I got into that category. She's been to Paris, she's been to Africa, she's done these things. And last year I even sang at the Indians game, right when we were in the winning streak, sang the Star Spangled Banner. So does that sound like somebody who's an upstander? A little bit, kind of, maybe? You gotta stand up in front of all these people. So part of being an upstander, you gotta stand up in front of all these people. So I'm not afraid of people, would you think? 
Who thinks I'm afraid of people? Raise your hand. Who thinks I definitely couldn't be afraid of people standing up in front of all those people? <laughs> Could not be afraid. Could not be afraid. But what my mind went back to was when I was in, um, I think the seventh, I was seven years old, so I was in the second grade. I had, at that point, probably been to maybe eight elementary schools. That's a lot of schools, right? So I didn't have any friends because I was in so many different schools, back and forth, back and forth. Um, I was in one school called Waterson Lake on the west side, and I never even think about this uh, incident. And Waterson Lake, all of the kids were, were mean and I do use all concrete, <laughs> I use it. They were very, very mean to me and bullied every day. And at that point, I wanted an upstander. I wanted the teacher to stand up and say something. And what I discovered, the teacher wasn't standing in for honey, nobody was. And so I made up in my mind, I am on the west side and live on the east side, I am out of here. <laughs> I am gonna find my way, I'm not waiting on the bus. And so I ran away from school, made it all the way to the highway I'm seven years old running. So right now when people ask about this person who I can do a TED talk, I can go and speak to thousands, it's because I'm an upstander because I have a memory and I remember what it was like when no one stood up for me and I needed someone. So I think when we think back at that, I think an upstander is putting yourself in a position, would you want to feel that way? Would you want kids saying, isn't that the same outfit you had on for the past four days? And it was, it, it was. And everyone in the class talked about it and it felt awful. So now I stand up because no one stood up for me. So it's my honest, not profound, but it's my honest answer. <laughs> so I guess going off from that, so we, we are at our second annual uh, elementary school <laughs> forum and, and today is focused on choices. So. Um, going off of that, I remember when I was in elementary school, I was, I was picked on for being smart. I was bullied um, at a young age, and um, I can remember from right now the exact point of where it was one individual that, um, that chose to, to, be the by, to be the upstander between the bully and, and myself. And I remember most of the classmates that I, I graduated with and I still remember today were mostly bystanders. And so I, I want... What were what would you like, or what were you like when you were at the age um, of the young people that are in the audience? And, and could you remember a point in elementary school where you had to incorporate, you know, the words that we're talking about today: upstander, bystander, per perpetrator, victim. Um, what do you observe in, in your elementary school, and what were choi what choices were being made, and what were the impacts of those choices? Um. I'll piggy right back. I think I learned forgiveness because when I came back to school, the teacher threw a big party and my personality was, I don't want your party. I don't want anything. I don't want to come back to the school. But I learned to interact with people who were, um, I think they were learning the meaning of being an upstander through having been a perpetrator and giving them the space to, to change. And I think those are lessons you have to learn and keep with you for the, your entire life. So I learned to give people space to evolve and change. Like can an enemy or can a bad person become your friend after they've already been mean and hurt you? Yeah, they like, no. Somebody in the back said, absolutely not, no. I think they can. And I learned to give people that kind of space. Anyone else? And I'll say my experience when I was your age was just a little different um, because sort of like you, uh, Mr. Price, I was, I was smarter, so I was in major work classes or honors classes. But what I had was I had teachers who were amazing. And I had teachers that always stood up and they spoke up when they saw things were not right. And so sort of unlike um, Ms. Honey's experience when she had to come back to school to have a party, I had the benefit of seeing teachers who immediately got involved when they saw things happening. And that had a deep impact on me because it sent a message to me really early on. You know, I knew that my only teachers weren't my parents at home, but that I had, you know, really clear instruction from my teachers in school. And so when I saw them speak up and I saw that it was okay to say, 
you don't talk to someone that way or don't say those words or that's really hurtful or sit with so-and-so at lunch because they're by themselves or you don't kick sand in someone's eye just because you know they look like they aren't the same as you that these were the things that I internalized early on. And I took those messages and I started to embrace them really early on. So I made, I tried to make friends easily, although it wasn't perfect. Um, you know, hardly anyone wants to be friends with the smart kids, right? <laughs> um, but what was really important was that I don't think any of us on this stage, and you all too will learn this, is that you don't become anything really in this world without first having a teacher pour into you. They're the ones that remind you of how special you are, how much talent you have, how excited they are to see you become something. And that coupled with all the encouragement you get at home sort of encourages you to be something great later on. And so that's what I had the benefit of seeing. I'm not going to say it's all, it was all great because I, it wasn't by any stretch, but I had really, really great teachers who gave me great lessons early on. For me, um, I feel like I kind of went along that whole spectrum. So, you know, being bullied by bystander to being an upstander now. In elementary school, I, I hung out with friends. And so um, there are studies now that show like when you hang out with your friends, sometimes that peer pressure, it, it influences the decisions that you make. And so I remember in elementary school, and my dad is here, so he could <laughs> attest to that, is that, you know. I tell the truth, though. I know. I'm a truth. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got suspended a lot. It was to the point to where, you know, I was always in a principal office, about to get expelled from Superior Elementary School in East Cleveland. And it took that moment where my mom came up to the school. It was in third grade. And she had a belt around her neck. Oh, my God. And <laughs> I got a whooping at school, and it was that point to where it, it flipped for me because now I was the one being talked about or being picked on because my mom came up there with a belt around her neck, and everybody know what happened after that. Um, and I, it was in Miss Gobble's class, and I remember that teacher saying, you know, this is what happens when you make that choice to do such and such and such and such. And so for me, I'm sitting there crying crying about homework, crying about what just happened, but it was that moment where my mom and my dad coming up to the school and that teacher pouring into me, um, as some of them said up here, to say that you have to begin to make different choices. You have to begin to get better grades. You have to begin to think about what your future is gonna look like. And I'm sitting here hearing all this and I'm in the third grade and I'm, I'm thinking about, well, you know, the future is so, so far away. But it wasn't because I had to begin to make those choices to prepare for where I, am, where I am at today. To be on this stage today, I never thought I would be at the City Club, never knew about the City Club in elementary school, but to be in a place and be on this panel is just a testament to a choice that you make this early on in your life, to be able to begin to do what's right and stick up for what's right and begin to find your, your own path. So I didn't begin to find that path until middle school. I started doing volunteer work at Kirk Middle School. Um, I started getting good grades. I won the Martin Luther King Jr. Award, and that to me was one of the biggest awards that I've, I've had today because it was, it was moments like that to where it just shows that switch that I made, that time to where I made that conscious choice to say, this is what I want to do, and this is what I want to become. And then, you know, just being a smart kid like Anthony, going to Shaw, um, Ms. Uragi um, Eiler here was, my teacher in, at Shaw High School, and just being able to have those teachers that support you and being able to excel, make, being able to look at those choices that we ultimately make. And it was a great experience for me because it just changed me and it allowed me to do things and stick up for people and stick up for my community in a way that I never thought that I would do because when I graduated from Case, Western Reserve University, when I was doing um, youth programs at Neighborhood Leadership Institute or on my own, that was for my community. So my community graduated with me. My family graduated with me. Mm -hmm. So those are the choices um, and the thoughts and the values that I hold to where I just, I just had to change because 
mom wasn't going to show up anywhere else with a belt around her neck. So. <laughs> All right. Um, I just want to ask one more question before we head to mid-forum announcements. Um, one of my favorite quotes that holds true for me, being an upstander, is from a uh, distinguished author, activist, uh, and wife of one of the, of the world's most notable civil rights leader we know, Dr. Martin Luther King, and that's uh, Coretta, Coretta Scott King. And she once said, my story is a freedom, of, freedom song of struggle. It is about finding one's purpose, how to overcome fear, and to stand up for causes bigger than oneself. Has anyone in your life influenced you and molded you being, uh, or molded you to be an upstander? And if so, what did they do or say that struck you and still holds true for you today? So I'll take this one because it's a bit of a story and I'll, I'll let the other panelists do this. Um, I have to tell you, I have the honor and the blessing of having two parents that are just amazing. And I'll tell you, you guys, that um, I tell folks all the time, I didn't have to look far for superheroes. I had them at home. I have three sisters, so it's four girls in the house, so you can imagine it's absolute chaos. <laughs> Nobody wants to share anything, ever, <laughs> even steal. <laughs> um, and drawing straws is never a way to break a tie, ever. I always got the short one. So, um, but when I was younger, um, and just as my oldest sister was preparing to graduate from high school, um, at the time, my parents, who both of whom had graduated from high school, and at the time, neither of my parents had gone to college because my mother was from the South, my father, a native Clevelander, they just adopted a mindset that said, listen, you, you take care of your family, you work a job, you pay your bills, you make sure your children's life is better than yours. And sometimes you sacrifice to do that. Um, and so when my sister, who is exceptionally smart, brilliant young lady, graduated from high school, she graduated with an offer of a full scholarship to Akron University. And she, although having been offered this full scholarship, she turned it down. And she turned it down because she wanted to be like my mom and dad. And she figured, hey, listen, she'll just get a job. She'll work like them. She'll perhaps have a family, take care of her kids, and maybe the next generation would be better than her. But that was the example she had. My parents were mortified. Their feelings were hurt because this was their opportunity to see their firstborn do better than them. Remember, your moms and dads and everybody around you in your village want to see you do so much better and to carry that community forward. And so when my parents saw that my sister wasn't going to take advantage of her scholarship and she wasn't going to go to college, even though she had this opportunity, they took her up on her offer and my parents then enrolled in college with her. And so my mom and my dad and my sister all went to school together. And so today my sister has two master's degrees. She's a teacher as well. And my parents both have PhDs. And from that moment on, they taught me something with their courage, which was first that I never had another excuse to not do well. They could have chosen to just tell us, do what we didn't do, and we're going to require you. But instead, they gave us the best example. They gave us themselves. And that, I think, took a lot of courage for them to do. They weren't young by their standards, and certainly not by mine. I mean, that by then, I thought 40s was, you know, almost nursing home age. I have a different opinion about 40 now, I'll tell you. Um, but I really thought they were, in my mind, older. But they set the standard, and that because of that, I was able to become a first-generation lawyer, a first-generation judge, because my mom and dad, who just celebrated 50 years of marriage, and so they're still together. They set the standard, so much courage for me and my sisters that, that we all followed suit. And I'm so proud of them because that gave me the courage to do things that I never thought I could do. And being in public service, being a judge, 
is public service. This is a cause greater than myself. I see some good folks on their worst days, and yet my job is to see past who I see and to understand the circumstances. And so because of them, I'm able to, I believe, do the work that I do, um, not because I want praise or because I have to wear a robe, but because it really is service and it really is giving back. Well, for me, um, there's one person that, but doesn't really represent a person, I would say represent a system or a thought um, or an idea. And that would probably be the East Cleveland school system. Mm. For some, that would probably sound far-fetched because of the stigma sometimes that goes with East Cleveland. Mm. Unlike um, the judge, I did not have the two parents or, or the one, really. But once I moved to East Cleveland, all the things I said that I experienced with the teacher not being an upstander, I had the entirely opposite total paradigm shift once I reached East Cleveland. So everything that I wanted to do, experience, become, get my hands wet at trying, I had all of these adults supporting me saying, go for it. So now when you see these guys in yellow shirts, it is only because this person in the purple suit um, loved and supported me. She was, she was more than my teacher and I won't start crying, she was my friend. Um, and still is my friend. And still, she is. She's still my friend. And in those very difficult days and tough moments, mm -hmm. I was able on those free moments to take a journal and write whatever I was feeling. On her free teaching periods or lunch periods, I can sit and read her. This is what I'm feeling. This is my poetry. And so when, and I'm not saying it because she's in the room, when I published my first book, dedication page is on there. So now when these guys publish their works, um, I pour as much into them as someone poured into me, she wouldn't let me fail. And so when it came to doing the graduation speech, when I graduated, it was gonna be me up there, I don't care who else was in the audience, I knew I had this supportive person who loved me after school closed. She still loved me, she stood up for me, and still loves me. Um, the first flight I ever took, I think you and we were on the same flight. <laughs> first flight I ever took, I was flying um, with Ms. Shiragi. <laughs> Uh, we were going to Madison, Wisconsin to defend a law case. Um, and so now when my guys take their first flight next to me having the same jitters, I'm just passing on what an upstander um, passed on to me. So it was no marvelous, even though it made the front page, that's great, but it's just recycling what someone already, I was in the paper with her when she was teacher of the year in 1992. I still have that paper. So these are the impactful, life-changing things that are the foundation. The first high school graduate in my family, the only of my siblings to graduate high school is me, is me, and then college. But it's because I had teachers, a system that supported me and believed in my success. Yes. I'll just echo what they said um, as far as just that caring adult that's in your life, that teacher, that coach, um, anything that you may be involved with, they are the ones that's gonna be there for you if you may not be able to get that from, from home or from your family, extended family. And so um, for me, it was the teachers. And so I didn't mind if people started sending out the teacher pet, because at that time I knew I had a goal in mind and I knew what I was getting from that adult. And I knew that they were pushing me or exposing me to different things that I could then in turn expose my family to. And then now, as far as just recycling that to young people that we work with now. All right, if we can give them a round of applause, it was really good. And I'll turn it over to Gabby for mid form announcements. Thank you again to our panelists. Amazing discussion so far. Uh, today we are enjoying a forum featuring Ms. Honey Bell Bay, Mr. Dante Gibbs, and Judge Gail Williams Byers. As our moderator, we have Mr. Anthony Price. We're about to begin the Q&A portion of today's forum. Uh, today we are joined from students from Campus International, Cleveland College Preparatory School, Cleveland Montessori, Village Prep Woodland Hills, and Walton Elementary School. Their attendance is made possible by generous support from AT&T, today's community partner is Teach for America, 
and we welcome every questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, any parents, teachers that may be here, community members. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will try to work it into the program. We want to remind you that your questions should be brief and concise to the point. Holding the microphones today are our are, are, are marketing and outreach fellow, Faye Walker, and content associate, Teddy Eisenberg. May we have our first question, please? What do you guys do? <laughs> I think that's a very important question. Anyone want to start? That we skip first base on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for me, for, for the past four and a half years, so once I graduated from Case West Reserve, I worked at a place called Neighborhood Leadership Institute. And so I was able to do um, youth programs, mainly for middle school to high school young people, um, just being able to allow them to find their voice, advocacy, um, them being able to do service projects in their communities and being able just to manage that piece. Um, but soon I will start um, as a gun fellow at the George Gun Foundation, where I could be in the um, look at the next level as far as thinking about some of the projects or policies that shape our neighborhoods and, and the lives that we live. I'm the judge of South Euclid Municipal Court. Um, as the presiding judge there, I handle all of the criminal cases that come through, and you might know them better as sometimes um, they're theft cases when perhaps someone is accused of taking something that does not belong to them. Um, some of our assault cases, um, or even some traffic cases. So if someone's driving too fast, or if there's a car crash, or there are other violations that are committed in a car, then I, ha I handle those. But then I also handle what are called civil cases, and those usually involve money. So they could be everything from maybe someone perhaps not paying their taxes to not paying a credit card bill or owing other monies for other reasons. Those come into the court. Do you ever watch Judge Judy? I see a whole lot of hands up. Okay. I want to invite you all to come visit the South Euclid Municipal Court. Please do not learn your law from TV. <laughs> We have a Democracy Day program, so I would invite you all to please come and see it in live and in person so that I can show you how this branch of government really works. But if you ever watch court on television, it's sort of similar to that, but not exactly. Okay? And I um, train both adults and youth. I train adults how to work with you all and then I train young people to perform and take their art, the guys that you saw earlier, and we travel together with their poetry, some that I write. I train famous um, artists such as Shakespeare. Shakespeare would say to me, I also train Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, Dr. King would say to me, Let us rise up tonight with the greater readiness. Let us stand with a greater determination. And let us move on in these powerful days, these days of challenge to make America what it ought to be. So in a snapshot, once we're done with this, we go into schools, community centers, um, different states, graduations, performing and edutaining to entertain while uh, educating, um, but mostly with, with, young, with young men. Another, one more question. Did one of you come here when you were kids? That's a good question. 
So just to reiterate the question, did did they come here when they were uh, in, in your position? Yeah. Did you guys come to City Club when you were in? in your I position? would have loved to have been invited here when I was your age. Um, and so, I, unfortunately, this wasn't here when I was your age, but I won't tell you how long ago <laughs> that must have been. <laughs> Lest Dr. King stand back up. <laughs> <laughs> What I will say <laughs> is that I'm excited to be here with you now. <laughs> and my first time here was in high school, so it was a school field trip similar to what you were doing. This elementary form, you guys are only the second group experiencing this. So this is, you all are still part of making history. So this is only the second time that this has happened. Thank you for having us. So what I wanted to say, I know y'all have accomplished some things, but do you want to go higher? Mm, nice question. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right then. <laughs> so, well, I, I definitely want to go um, higher. Um, I'm 28, and so I still have a, a lot of things that I want to learn and, and accomplish. And so um, part of that is, is making a choice, and sometimes it could be a sacrifice. So um, being able to start this new um, job that I'll be starting in June at the George Gunn Foundation is a part of me trying to learn more and go higher um, professionally and personally. I dream of starting um, Distinguished Gentlemen Academies all across the country, along with the young man you just heard. And so we have a plan like Pinky and the Brain for total world domination to take over the world. So. <laughs> When we get done, we plan to leave no child uneducated. So we definitely have a plan to take over the world. Um, my short answer is yes. Um, I do want to go higher. But believe it or not, it doesn't necessarily have to be as a judge. I have a deep passion for educating and empowering our community. I think I do a lot of educating from the bench, and so meaning as a judge. But even if my next step in life were something similar but, but slightly different, I could be really happy doing that as long as I give people the tools they need to live a better life. Our next question. What have you learned? What? <laughs> <laughs> what have you learned? <laughs> I guess this what have you learned over <laughs> What have you learned? What have you learned over the years? So, I, so just to reiterate the question. Um, so, I, what have you learned over um, whether? And I, I actually want to um, incorporate something into that question. What have you learned um, being an upstander in you know elementary school, high school, to college, and now to your professional life? What have you learned? Um, what it takes to be an upstander today. I think it takes a lot of courage. It takes, um, you know, just being able to be um, empathetic of, of people's situation, being able to understand what someone else may be going through. So putting yourself in someone else's shoes, but also realizing that that work doesn't just stop with that one person or that situation. It continues. And so, so once you start upstanding and being that upstander, it doesn't stop because there's always going to be um, situations to where you may have to speak up not only for yourself, but for your friends, um, your family, and also your community. Um, and so that's some of the things that we just try to do, I'm sure all of us. Um, but for me personally, through the events like Turkey Takeover, so being able to um, provide hope for um, people from East Cleveland, so I still live there, and just being able to um, alleviate some of the stresses that go along with the holiday season as far as trying to figure out where that Thanksgiving meal is going to come from. And we also do a Christmas event um, similar to that. So just providing, surprising families on Christmas Eve with gifts. Um, just knocking on the door and saying, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. And so I think that's one thing that I've learned over the years is that it's not just one thing, but you have to continue on to upstand and be, a, be that upstander. I would agree. I think that um, if there are two, I think, strong characteristics of an upstander, the first would be courage, because it takes a lot of courage to, to be one and to stay one. 
And it also takes consistency because once you see what's, what needs to be corrected, you also have to have the courage to keep doing it over and over again because these things don't go away after the first time. You've got to have the courage to do it again if you see it happening again. And you can always pay it forward because sometimes when, when you act and you stop what's wrong, someone will see your courage and they'll feed off of it and you can pass the baton to them. And then they then gain the courage to do the same thing. And so you're able to continue that. And if you're consistent, they'll have the courage to be consistent. So I would say courage and consistency. Thanks. So I, I guess the final message I, I just wanna, I, what I've learned from, from this panel discussion is taking the baton uh, to, um, for the young people in the room that you have to take the baton, someone's gonna give you the baton. So you are having the baton to be uh, the next upstander for your generation. So with that, I'll turn it over to Gabby for uh, closing announcements. Perfect, can we give one more brief round of applause for our panelists and our moderator? Thank you so much. Thank you. Today we have enjoyed the City Club of Cleveland's second elementary youth forum, Be an Upstander, Why Our Choices Matter. I just want to quickly reiterate some of the uh, takeaway call to action points that our panelists have outlined. Be courageous, be action oriented, be assertive, be compassionate, and be a leader, which we see plentiful up here. Uh, thank you to our panelists again, ladies and gentlemen, and upstanders around the world. This forum is now adjourned. For information also, on upcoming speakers, we or have for a special treat from Ms. Honeybell Bay Club. and our distinguished gentlemen of spoken word. They're going to be giving us an encore performance. So please stick around and let's listen to them. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University, Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund.